Everything we know, from people and ants, to stars and galaxies, to quarks and atoms, the entire universe, might just be a simulation running inside a supercomputer, inside an even bigger universe. Ancient philosophers said that the universe is a dream that we're waiting to wake up from. In this dream world of the imagination, anything is possible. All cultural items, from the dreams of our rodent-like ancestors, to books, to television shows, are merely permutations of the reality we think we live in. Today's age of computers and video games places simulations at the center of our cultural consciousness. A select group of us perform simulations for fun and profit, and we call them games, role-playing and otherwise. We live to run simulations. Join us on the Simulationist Podcast as we explore our culture of simulations. Hello and welcome to the first episode of the Simulationist Podcast. I'm Josh Trelevin, and sitting with me in his kitchen is... Ryan Kirkby. Hi to you. Hey, and we're a couple of guys from Vic- well, living in Victoria, BC, and we're going to do a, a podcast about all things simulation, and by that we mean video games, role-playing games, basically any sort of culture in the world, uh, really. And um, let me see. Uh, I guess we can do a little bit of uh, description of ourselves. Um, we like to play, like, we're both big role-playing gamers. Mm-hmm. Uh, we play Dungeons and Dragons, among other games. Um, Ryan, do you have any other anything to add about where you, um, why you want to do this podcast, uh, and um, why you think this kind of this idea of simulation might be uh, a good way to approach a podcast? Well, a large part of our our consciousness it comes from false experiences. The movies you see, the books you read, the games you play, none of it's all real. And yet, in, especially in this day and age, it actually comprises a bulk of the average person's memories. You remember the movies better than you remember events back in your own grade school. Oh, so that's, that's good. Uh, yeah, so we're, we probably are going to cover uh, movies and mm-hmm. uh, books and things like that. Um, so uh, I have prepared a couple of, um, I guess they're thought-provoking questions for us just to uh, have our first conversation about today. Um, the first one that I, I have, uh, I'll ask you, Ryan, and you can mm-hmm. answer, and then I'll, I'll share some of my own thoughts. Um, this question is, how many rules should there be in a good game? I think it's a bit of a razor's edge sort of thing. Uh, I've seen games with almost no rules in them, and it works well. And I've seen games with rules to cover everything, and it can work well. But they both have their drawbacks. I mean, a system with huge amount of rules, aside from being expensive to buy, make, you know, and and time-wise just to read winds up intimidating people away. You don't want to read the Encyclopedia Britannica before you can get down to playing a game session. Okay, so I guess when you say a, a big uh, like a big set of rules, or I guess we're talking about something like 3rd edition Dungeons & Dragons, which has basically three books you need to buy. Yes. Um, um, previous editions, I have an older one myself, everything came in, just a small box, didn't cover as much, but you, if you could get it done within about an hour's worth of reading, and then you're ready to go. On the other hand, a lack of rules such as what they had led to some very damaging abuse of the game system, wherein you couldn't effectively play anything but a set group, because if you did anything less, you simply wouldn't be able to survive the worst encounters. You would be outshone by the people who were doing it. Well, I, I don't know if that's a, um, a, an issue of too many rules or, like, the number of rules. I mean, I guess that can be a factor, but I, um, some of that is just plain design. I mean, whether the rules are well-designed or poorly designed. I mean, if if you have a game with um, few simple rules, it it doesn't... In, that um, encourages players to stay within certain boundaries and to have the crafted experience that the designers mm-hmm. intended. Well, if there's one thing I've seen from gamers over the years, it's that uh, no matter how good you've tried to set the rules, somebody's going to try and break them. 
Somebody's going to try and bend them, and somebody's going to try and contort them around his hand to use like a glove. <laughs> and well, that's one of the reasons why people get so ironclad for the rules. Is you you can't knit the rules together to be that glove if you've got yourself a block of metal, so to speak. Sure. Well, don't you find those people who like the rules lawyers? Do you find them like kind of I'm um, almost buzzkills or? Or, whatnot, or does that depend if they're just on their personality? Well, I suppose in the end, so long as everyone's having fun, it's it's okay. So long as everyone's okay with a rules lawyer in the group, that's fine. Um, that said, yeah, they actually are kind of a buzzkill. Um, but that's only if you're trying to play a game counter to theirs, and what they're doing winds up somehow trumping or generally undoing what you're trying to do. All right. Now, when we're talking about also like how many rules should be in a game, um, I mean, I, I guess it's a silly question. I mean, well, I came up with the question, but um, it, some like some games are like simple. I mean, if we're talking about the entire spectrum of like s- simulating a thing and having it in a game, I mean, Monopoly counts, right? And oh. and the game where you just go around the board and and roll the dice and count how many you know you're not a character you're just a um, you're, you're just a, a figure like a piece of pewter um, mm-hmm. but there are other games where you can do a lot more um, mm-hmm. and ma- maybe there's a, a point maybe there's like a tipping point where there's just enough rules to make you think that you can do anything and you know D&D mm-hmm. that's generally in the impression we have in a role playing game like D&D that we can do anything we want um, and that comes from having just enough rules to to encourage players to to go wherever they want to go. Mm-hmm. Whereas, like a game with less rules, might they, you know, the players might not have that creativity based on what would happen, kind of like thinking about a role, but just of how they can exploit the rules. Mm-hmm. Well, I think one of the best examples of a rules light game would be like the uh, the stuff that cheap ass games used to put out. If you remember that. Uh, they basically said, well, if you guys will provide the dice or the deck of cards or, you know, the little tokens, we'll provide the quick set of rules and then you can play a game for five bucks. Oh, yeah. Oh, and that's a good idea. I have them somewhere, somewhere in my admittedly too vast collection. And it's decent stuff. I mean, if you're the, the purpose of the game is something simple, like uh, how much stuff can you steal from an unprotected mall, people aren't going to be trying weird things. On the other hand, when you get to, to some of the other stuff, like D&D, you hit a, actually an interesting phenomenon, because I believe Gary Gygax once said, rule number zero of gaming is don't tell any of the players or any of the DMs that they don't need your rules. You don't need technically oh, yeah. three books of it. All you need that. is yeah, some basic uh, stuff to stat up to work from it, and you can build the rest yourself. You don't need, you know, a book saying what this world is like or what that's going on in their towns, what the populations are. You can make that all up yourself. You don't need to to have to buy an extra set of books to cover if you want to play a different race of well, creature. Or you could run that that game out of the Encyclopedia Britannica instead of, or I guess nowadays, out of Wikipedia. Like in Gygax's days, it would have been the Encyclopedia, but nowadays it would be Wikipedia. Yeah. You can run your game out of Wikipedia. You Like you... The reference books you need aren't necessarily... don't have to be D&D on the cover. And we'll say... We'll be generous and say you need the three main books. But even after that, they came out with a lot of splat books, and if you look at my collection, I have admittedly purchased... Possibly more than the average gamer has for 3.0, 3.5. And uh, that's fully conscious knowing that, no, I don't have to buy them. They do market them very well. Yeah, that's, that's a good point because um, those extra slap books, I mean, they obviously sell well. There's obviously a demand for more rules. I don't know if, if the demand is specifically for rules, but maybe the demand is for content. Mm-hmm. But... Um, they, there's there seems to be a desire, especially like among like D and D community and and similar games. There's a demand to make your character better and and more like more closer to your vision mm. and things like that. And I guess more rules options helps that. I mean, I don't see why you can't just you know tell the story, but 
um, I guess it does help to have like a feat that, or you know, some bit of the rules that describes why that part of your background is important. Uh, sure. Well, I think uh, essentially for D&D, how I've always likened it is it's just a natural expansion and progression from the old cowboys and Indians. Bang, bang, I shot you. No, you didn't. How do you resolve it? Well, you know, you can just say flip a coin. If it comes up heads, you shot them. On the other hand, you might want to start developing more nuance to it. Well, my, I'm Black Bart, you know, I'm the greatest gun shooter in the West. Versus, you know, I won't, you know, I'm the greatest dodger there ever was, you know, so you start working up some rules to cover that. Maybe, you know, based on how long you've played, you can determine how much of this stuff you get so one person isn't the omni character who can do everything. And before you know it, you've got a Western version of Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> Yeah, and I suppose I suppose that is where Dungeons and Dragons came from because um, it was uh, basically Gygax playing ga- like miniatures games with his friends and tweaking the rules um, enough that it became its own game and and adding fantasy elements into basically a you know historical reenactment. Because let's face it, I mean it's fun to reenact the Battle of Waterloo. But if Napoleon had sorcerers, well, let's see what happens. Shooting fireballs around. Well, sure. I, I don't <laughs> know if that would be my bag to necessarily pollute Waterloo that way. Um, but I, I do appreciate a good fantasy battle, mm. like a good like wizards versus dragons, that kind of deal. Yeah. Um, yeah, sure. Well, that's where it came out. It was the basics for for Dungeons and Dragons did start off as the miniature uh, war gaming sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and, and you I didn't want to focus on one platoon of people. You want to focus on just one guy who was really great and he was good at one thing or he could do something special. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's yeah, that's what I wanted to talk about too about um, simulating the world, where you know you have you pick your level of of how you're going to simulate. You pick your your unit, which is mm-hmm. like you might have 50 units or 50 men in a unit, mm-hmm. you know that's your unit, or you might have a single one, and and those have different implications for how that simulation, you know, ultimately plays out as as a game, and you know some it might be f- like one might be fun in some way that mm-hmm. the other one isn't, or um, one might capture something, uh, some sort of the essence of that experience of that story of the battle mm-hmm. that you want to tell again. Well, there's uh, there's a difference between trying to simulate reality itself and just coming up with a good enough approximation, which is what they freely admit to with D&D. They're not going to try and work out how many hit points your arm has before somebody lops that darn thing off. They just say, well, you know what, we're not going to go down to that level of resolution on reality, and we're just going to say you got hit points, whether or not you dodged it, whether or not you partially avoided it, or whether or not you took that uh, that fireball blast straight in the face but still got up because you're just that darn tough. That's up to you. Yeah, and and that, well, the, the, the funny, like, my quibble with that, I guess, and it's not a big quibble, like, I don't have that much problem with it, but my quibble is that once you go down that path and start talking about hit points, it's very easy to just add on and add mm-hmm. on and add on. Like, as you get tougher, you just get more and more hit points, and that's that's mm-hmm. progression in the game. And it kind of breaks down the higher level you get. It becomes a game that's just... It, it's just math at that mm-hmm. point, and it's, and it's nonsensical. Like, there's no sense of drama anymore with, like, you know, two warriors duking it out or whatever, because it is just, oh, I slash you, you slash me... And repeat till someone falls. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Uh, Although they are doing fairly good uh, at trying to stop that for D and D next, as, as to define more precisely than previous editions have ever tried to as to what hit points encompass. Well, I, I would like yeah. to see that. Yeah. yeah. Well, they have talked about it in, in, in a little bit here and a little bit there. I would like to see it, the final what they say, but generally it's just a little nick here, or you actually manage to avoid it your hit points still drop until you hit about halfway and then you start getting all messed up and, you know, you've got cuts coming on here and it gets progressively worse. But it's a little different when your commoner has four hit points versus your paladin with 30 hit points. What exactly a cat can do to a human being. You send four cats against a commoner, they'll kill them in one round. Mm -hmm. The paladin takes care of them. And how do you describe that? Like, how did the cats kill this fully grown human when another fully grown human just 
just slaughtered them like they were cats. Well, and th- that's that's the thing with the, the game as a simulation is that every simulation is going to have holes in it because um, it's like it's designed basically kind of one dimensionally. It's like looking through the player's eyes at a cat and a commoner, and mm. it's n- the game is not looking sideways at the cat fighting the commoner. It's mm. like just looking straight at. So it, it that the idea is it's supposed to be a representation of the threat that each of those pose to one particular character in the mix. Although, um, yeah, the, you can, and that's but uh, that's what I also wanted to say. About, like I like about simulation of, of D and D is that it kind of feels like a real world. It kind of feels like you should be able to fight the cat versus mm-hmm. the commoner. Although it's kind of hard to expect four cats to kill a person. Although, I, I mean, you really have to figure out a reason why the four cats would try and kill a person in the first place. I um, mean, yeah. <laughs> that is, that, but let's face it, D&D does, uh, uh, lots of games do give up voluntarily that level of realism for the level of heroism. You are bigger than life because you are the hero. And that means sometimes fudging what reality does with you. That means, yes, sometimes you, you will find four cats willing to just pounce on you and fight to the death. I, I guess, I mean, that's a, that can be <laughs> fun. And that, yeah, I, I, <laughs> that's a, it's an interesting uh, thought. Um, that can be a fun game. And um, it's, it's not very realistic, but I mean, who's, yeah, I mean, who says games have to be realistic? And, and although, Kind of the, the there is a kernel of like where do games come from? They come from something we observe in kind of real life, mm-hmm. and and we want to imitate it, and we want to we want to tweak it, but basically we want to copy you know scenarios that happen yeah. in real life. We want to simulate them, or which is to, yeah, to keep saying, which is why I bring up the concept of why would the cats be attacking a person? Cats may scratch and claw, you know, when things are going bad, but they don't go for the jugular. To the best of my knowledge, I mean, some yeah. dogs. If you abuse them, yeah, cats are more of a flee than fight sort of thing. So the whole premise of the cat versus the commoner, it's not exactly a, maybe a problem with the rules, but more of a problem with uh, with the DM and how they decide to interpret the rules and present their mock up of reality. Well, I, I like that, but I wouldn't necessarily blame the DM. I mean, yeah, the DM can be like. <laughs> inexperienced or whatnot. Mm-hmm. But I think there is there is something in unwritten in the core of D and D that's like things fight each other. You know, it, I guess because the game is so much geared against like who can beat what and what can beat another thing mm-hmm. that basically you're once you step into the world of D and D, you step into this mindset of everything fights everything else. And trust me, I've seen that. I've seen people fighting cows in Second Edition just to get the experience, <laughs> just smacking the cow until it fights, so you can get the experience because it was a threat. Yeah. And it, it does become oddly detached from reality at that point. But that's the player's problem, most definitely. And and the poor DM that has to put up with those guys is it, well. It, my heart bleeds <laughs> for him. <laughs> I I do. <laughs> I think I blame the players. Well, basically, I blame the the player who doesn't realize that they're not supposed to kill everything, but also the DM who doesn't provide guidance. But also, I mean, if that's just... Like, the game, as it's set up, is assuming certain things, and it can get in the culture. Like, it, mm-hmm. it can be no one's fault. Well, it might be the designer's fault. Um, but there's also this, this un- unspoken track that some people catch on to that you're not supposed to kill everything and I, I'm sure Gygax wrote somewhere that you know he punished his players severely for attacking something they shouldn't have attacked um, well he usually just lets them die for <laughs> being so stupid as to attack that I do recall a couple of occasions where a person would just charge up onto everything and yeah. I think it, Gygax was the reason why in 3.0 3.5 they had the uh, the whole it's statistics encounter and there was that 10% chance the encounter should be four challenge rating levels above your party just yeah. to help it reinforce the no you shouldn't attack everything until you get tired and then have a nap well yeah i've always liked the idea of that i rarely implemented it like as a like i've been a dm and i rarely implemented that um the the idea that there's an encounter that you know once 
you know, once a, a week or once every two weeks, whenever you meet, they're going to meet something that could potentially kill them. I, I mean, they're supposed to run away from it. <laughs> Obviously, that's Or the at idea. least find a non-violent way around it. I mean, um, well, just recently, there was uh, an article they were talking about the difference between ogres and trolls and how that's going to be presented in uh, D&D Next. And uh, ogres were the kind of, of people they described as, well, you know, they're evil, yes, but they can be bribed. So if you're a first-level party and there's an ogre guarding the other, you know, racist cave because they're hiring him, he can be bribed. So you don't need to be tough enough to beat the ogre. You just need to be able to think well enough to say, hey, why don't I offer him shiny things? <laughs> well, that, yeah, oh, I, I like that. That's a that's an interesting take on it. I mean, it, 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 it again, like, I'm going to tell you all the things that bother me about three, <laughs> about the, not the three point, the new edition, which is, I guess it'll be fifth edition. Um, and I think they did this for fourth edition too, and they do the and Pathfinder does this too, is that they try to define the monsters and say, okay, this is our take on the monsters, and and I, I sense that you enjoy this, and I do to an extent too. It does give a little bit more of a grounding on on what it is, because let's face it, there's a lot of different ways you can interpret some creatures, like uh, goblins. Yeah. From the WoW goblins where they're just greedy mercenaries to the D&D goblins where they're four hit points and, ooh, hey, 15 experience. Yeah. And, you know, then you can go over to the Pathfinder ones where they're completely non-human. They've got the big balloon-shaped heads. Yeah, they're, they're kind of like animals almost. Right? Yeah, it's how, how you want to present it. And actually just saying, okay, for this edition, basic how it's going to go, these are goblins. These are what they're like. You want to mess them up for your campaign? You want to make them seven feet tall, red skin, and, and like a warrior culture? Yeah, you can do that. Go ahead. Have fun. But this is just our basic thing. This is what it's going to be like for the generic campaign setting. Okay. Well, and that that's true. And I guess that I mean that puts a lot of pressure on a designer, like the or the company or the the team, I guess, who's designing it, um, because that uh, assumption becomes like. Uh, yeah, you can, you're allowed to deviate from it, but it also becomes the core experience of a lot of people, and a mm-hmm. lot of people that's their expectation. Like um, uh, Pathfinder goblins are a certain way, and that's if you're playing in a Pathfinder game, you expect that, and you mm-hmm. and if you don't get that, you might be disappointed. You might be if if the DM has his own creative take on how goblins are supposed to work. Well. I guess this is me talking as the creative DM, like mm-hmm. wanting to do interesting things with goblins mm-hmm. and being handed something I don't quite agree with, and yet players are expecting it. Well, you can be surprised at just how little change really affects things. I remember one campaign where uh, they were uh, the players were attacking hobgoblins, and the hobgoblins had some sort of uh, fleshy structure up on the top of their head. That was all that was different, no stats, freaked them out. What is up with these hobgoblins? They've got insignias like like coming out of their foreheads, and they made up ideas about cults going on. And it's like must be something warping their flesh to create it. Maybe these are the starts of beholder eye stalks. Oh no! What if this is where beholders come from? And they were doing stuff. I had no idea what I was even going to plan. But you know, a good idea is a good idea. So write it down and go. Wow, you guys are really good. <laughs> Wow, yeah, that's that's a really good point, and that's that's something I probably haven't done as, enough as a DM. I mean, I do that a little bit uh, um, sometimes as a DM, but yeah, that that just letting just letting the players kind of do the work and, and that, yeah, because I mean they're they're just as they're they play the game because they're creative. They're yeah. just as creative as you are as the DM. Well, hopefully, that's the sign yeah. of good players. They're willing to put in the time and effort as much as the DM to help create a, a nice unified whole. Yeah, but I mean, I recall times when I was DMing for some guys back home when I was growing up. I never had any plot. Half the time, they never even made it to the dungeon. <laughs> it was just about you know, like, okay, hey, you know, we're halfway there. I'm kind of bored. It's the end of the day. Let's play tag with daggers. <laughs> if that's what they want to do, I'm all for it. If they want to make up this weird conspiracy because the two random encounters happen to to be odd ends of things, then yeah, apparently there is some sort of consortium of genies and gnolls working together to kill the PCs. I can work with that. I can build from it. Yeah. Not exactly realistic, not exactly planned, but sometimes that's the best way things go. Well, that's that's good. That's good advice. 
well, that I think that covers. I mean, we went off on a bit of a tangent. I think that covers our first question that we had asked, which is about rules, mm-hmm. which was a dumb question, but I think we had a good well, conversation. I think in the end, uh, the, uh, the best way to describe a good set of rules would be like a net for fishing. Okay. There's not a lot to a net once you've got it out and fully unfolded, but it catches almost everything. Oh, and yet it still flexes when things push really hard against it. Well, tell me that's your your metaphor that you came up with. It is, actually. Oh, yes. good job. Uh, I was thinking long, long and hard. It's like, what's a good set of rules? How much is too much? Because I saw one that was a, like 500 pages just, just to get through, and there was all sorts of things nobody would ever need in that. I'm not even going to mention it by name. It was just a bad thing. Okay. And then there was some other stuff. like uh, I like the Mind's Eye Theater stuff, but it's... Uh, it's a little nebulous for my taste. Whereas if they were to have something that says, okay, in this sort of circumstances, just work on these guidelines. Yeah. It does mean you have to have a certain level of interpretive intelligence to understand what's going on and how to apply these rules if you want them to the best effect. But I think that's the best way to go in the end. Yeah. Well, and that's that's a good point because part of, well, what you said about interpretive, um, like being intelligent and being a good interpretive GM some a lot of that you learn that from other GMs mm-hmm. you learn that by going on uh, message boards and, t- and posting and reading other people's posts at, or listening to podcasts so listening to podcasts doing the research on forums and just getting the rote experience from in the field would be oh. like leveling up uh, yes yeah, of course yeah be like going to t- so yeah. leveling up tends mm-hmm. to not be abstract. Only that threshold at which you suddenly gain everything is the abstract. Uh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I'm quite pleased with that. Okay, so I, I have another question for discussion. If, if mm-hmm. you're, I don't know. Oh, go for okay. it. Go for it. Another question for discussion. Um, so this is because I know that you have a, a biology background. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to ask you, and and I might have something to say, but maybe not. We'll see. Um, if you wanted to simulate a forest in an mm-hmm. RPG setting, could a biologist, could it, I should enunciate, could a biologist do this, or would it depend on their specialty? Um, so do you know what I'm asking? Mm-hmm. Well, I don't think actually that it uh, would require being a biologist to give a better definition of a forest. What it takes is actually going out there and spending time in a forest to, to notice the little things that truly make it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it, not all forests have these huge, wonderful glades you can spontaneously wander in. Sometimes they're just light and sparse, nice thin trees going here, there, with the occasional shaft of light piercing it. And it's when you actually take the time and not just walk through the forest, but take time to look at the forest, you can get a much better level of detail as to what's actually going on. Okay, so we have some pretty, we have some nice parks around here. I don't mm-hmm. know how how wild some of them are. Um, well, there's like, urbanized deer, and they can get pretty aggressive, so I think that's wild enough. Wild enough. I, yeah. I suppose we have some, like, uh, like Finlayson, uh, Mount Finlayson near Victoria mm-hmm. has, a, has a pretty good forest. Uh, Mount Doug Park, my, where I live, or near where I live, um, it, I wonder about how, like, how naturalistic it is. Um, but I guess, I mean, you can just go in there, you can see, you can observe and just sample and just bring it back to your <laughs> creative endeavor. We're, we don't even have to be talking about D&D, we might be talking about writing a novel. Oh you, yes, especially yeah. if you want to set a scene, it really helps to have the person who's reading it see in their mind what's going on in the background as opposed to just like a blank sheet. Yeah. And another thing, I, like, I wanted to bring up like this this idea too because um, I think uh, in a lot of ways like basically creating a cultural thing like mm-hmm. writing a novel or a short mm-hmm. story or uh, creating a D and D game it, it can be it can be very like like you're writing in a journal it can be very you know this is what I experienced the other day I want to share it with you but I want to put a twist on it and, and like cover it up and mm-hmm. like say oh there were magic elves also or something like, like that um, but in a lot of like our endeavors, it seems to be that we just share what happens to us. Like we just say, you know, I was walking in the forest, I saw this, and maybe we might think that's a little lackluster. So when we bring it to our friends or our audience or whatever, we just say, oh well, 
you know, this is now this is part of a different story. It's part of something bigger. Well, I think that might be more because uh, writing, like almost anything, is, is best considered as a muscle. It gets stronger the more you use it. Like, uh, it, the best way to write a good novel is to write ten really bad novels. Okay. Get it out of your system, know what you're doing, and then work on with that. L- get your lessons, build something of true value. But I've heard it said that, um, let me see, how does it go? Your first novel is always basically an autobiography, like, mm. covered in whatever details. You, if you want to make it sci-fi, it's an autobiography of you, except you're on another planet or something like that. Well, that does work because, I mean, everybody ha- is able to write better when they talk about what they know. You don't know anybody better than you know yourself unless you're a horrible stalker person. In which case, you could actually put in an interesting spin on that, but once that whole get- thing gets figured out, it's just a no-go and you get wind up getting reviled. But uh, I think that's the best way to start from it is... Start from what you know. You know this kind of character because you are that kind of person. Yeah. So, so really, when you're writing, kind of yeah, the core of it mm-hmm. is you are always telling your own story. You are mm-hmm. always sharing something of yourself. Exactly. You, so, when you, when it comes to creating like you know imaginative worlds, like mm-hmm. other worlds, there is this whole other exercise of trying to make it realistic, trying to make it feel mm-hmm. like something. Uh, real and and part of it is just disguising like what you saw as something mm-hmm. else, and but part of it I, I guess is just study. It's just learning oh, yeah. about, and that's why I also wanted to ask about biology, because like, I mean, let me ask it another way. Mm-hmm. Does it help if you I know think something it, about biology? It can very much. If I was to describe the forest woods, I could better describe how the trees are growing based on if well if I want it to be something that runs on on. Uh, a system where it's it's there's a lot of mold going on. The mold is one collective entity as it runs through the the top of duff of the soil. Maybe I could right. describe it as having a uniform palette on the underside. If I wanted to have it with trees like uh, like uh, some of the trees that have runners, I can make sure to describe that they're plentiful and populous with, within the area with some other sorts of trees growing up. And if I wanted to get uh, interesting, I could make up a creature or something. Something like a rabbit, not a rabbit, but fills that void. Do you, um, like, you keep saying, I could do this, I could do that. Well, I haven't, yeah. I mean. <laughs> okay, um, do you see this as some, as worth your time, too? Like, when you're playing D&D, uh, like, or if, if you're writing a novel or whatever, you, mm-hmm. won't, you have so much time to describe things, is it, I guess it is worth it, throwing in those details, if you can... It's yes. definitely worth it to to be able to just because it doesn't take a lot to, to actually say. It might mm. take years to learn about, but mm. to actually say, oh yeah, there's runners and stuff. And well, you it's just not exactly that you have to describe how it's just runners, but knowing that how the system works, you can describe it a little bit more accurately. And the more accurately you, you describe something, the better off it sounds. It sounds more truthful. And take it from a guy who can lie pretty darn well. When you can sound like you know what you're talking about then everyone will believe you, even if you're just pulling stuff out of thin air. Oh, that's good. That makes you a perfect podcast host. Yeah, you know, I, you got to sell the confidence more than anything else, really. But, uh, I mean, the fact that I know how the uh, the chickadee system works out, you know, in dominance displays, I could make that up. If I wanted to, it could be a nasty, nasty forest, uh, trees thicker than, than an automobile sort of thing and they go up so high and instead of putting chickadees in there I could describe the whole thing with say gargoyles they're living in there and I could have them using a similar style I did design a campaign once where I actually used them as a migratory species oh that's that's really weird no one <laughs> suspects that of them but you know what they've got wings why can't they be a migratory species like birds are uh Sure, why not? And then it adds this added thing where all of a sudden you're thinking about gargoyles. How are they working? They're, they seem like a part of an ecosystem. They migrate uh, south in the winter to a nice warm spot, and that's where they give birth to their little rocky young, and once they <laughs> learn to fly, they head back to the, the mountains uh, up north. Okay, well, that's good. Um, uh, I like the way you just described describe that, too, because... Um, uh, I have I've played under DMs who've um, invented some aspect of their campaign world that I wasn't able to buy in like 
I don't know. I don't know if it's just because I'm at the table with you right now, but I was mm-hmm. able to buy into that idea of the gargoyles, and it sounded it sounded like something like if I was reading a piece of fiction or playing in a game mm-hmm. where that was the case. I might, yeah, I might actually be interested in following up. I've also, I've seen that kind of detail done badly, mm. where it just, it sounded superfluous, it sounded like I didn't want to do it. Well, see, that's the interesting thing, because you said you wanted to follow up on that. I actually had a reason why they go to where they go. There was a whole reason for that. I had it all worked out. It wound up never reaching fruition, but if the players ever did try going to the one island where they they go to mate every year, like you've seen some of the things of the birds in, in you know in, in the, when they're on their migratory thing and you can see this this small island off the coast and it's just filled with birds it's it's positively white with pelicans or whatever sure it yeah. would have been something like that but if you actually go there there was going to be an artifact that increases fecundity the gargoyles who go there have so many more young okay yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so that actually does reward the curious player, which I believe is always something everybody should try and strive for. If you're going to take the time to go and investigate the little things, reward a person for that. Okay. Well, yeah, that's and I'm I'm that's good that I'm glad you put that in. And part of it, I mean, is just being creative and being and having good ideas, and that's always fun to kind of brainstorm. Um, but the other thing, the the problem though, is that the the players never they never found that. I mean, right? No. Well, in the end, it never wound up going long. Uh, one person moved to Saskatchewan, another person okay, moved up island. Normal. So it kind of fell apart. Yeah. But uh, it could have worked itself easily into the uh, the campaign. For instance, if the people are wandering about in this land, and they, uh, they're they asking, why are these gargoyles attacking me? All of a sudden, I'm out in the open. Why are they here? They're not a plains creature. They're not listed that way. I can say, well, no, they're migrating south for the winter. And then, no, well, hmm. no. Okay, I guess that sounds like something a creature with wings would do. Well, that sounds reasonable, and maybe it's if it's a problem for the PCs, it's a problem for the NPCs as well. All of a sudden, they find themselves, well, you know, there's a dearth of adventures every winter, or every late fall when the uh, gargoyles migrate down, and then again in the uh, springtime when they migrate up north again. And so then maybe the players are looking for, well, you know, we could milk this, you know, every year for some decent, sweet, you know, cash protecting villagers. Or maybe we could find a way to uh, stop them. Where do they go every uh, winter? And I say, well, you know, if you make the right checks, they go down and, hey, there's an island they go to every year. You explore that. Imagine trying to get, just get to an island that's full of gargoyles. At best, you're on a boat, and they can fly. You know, I, as a player character, I cannot think of a lot of motivations to get me to do that. I mean, I, I, I have a dream of playing a naturalist in a role-playing game. Like, and I even I'm working on a character class which I, I haven't uh, finished yet, but it's called mm-hmm. the Surgeon. Ooh. And it's kind of based on the ship surgeon from like the British Navy kind oh, of thing. Oh yeah, yeah. And I, and I want to play a character like that who is curious about nature and things like that. See, and that's what I like because I could dig DMing that because that's a character I hey, there's a hook, there's something I can get them from A to B with, and not just say, well, there is fabulous, untold, unspecific treasures awaiting you if you <laughs> clear out these five to seven rooms. Yeah, which is which works for some characters. Admittedly, yes. But uh, it, it's always nice when you have that more personal hook. Why is he going there? This is part of his personal motivation. Why is everyone else going with it? Well, they're friends. They're just going along with their friend because, well, you know, hey, if a friend asks you to do something, you help them out. Yeah. And what else are you going to do? Well, and that's kind of the reason why we're all at the game table. Exactly. Exactly. I had a whole thing set up for it. It was going to be magnificent. There was actually going to be underground structures, and there was going to be, like, when gargoyles get too old, they don't, like, die or anything. That's They just stay permanently roosted on the oh, island. Okay. Oh, so, so this is, like, a, almost a dungeon, really. It like, would have been a nice like dungeon. An and there were some other flying creatures. I think I had harpies. The harpies come up in the summer, so it's like you get the uh, the difference in the timing that you can get with some animals, you know, when they're occupying the area. Okay. And uh, so the the elders yeah. of both of them would have combined to have because they're both technically intelligent, not greatly intelligent, but technically intelligent, and that goes up in your old age, according to the D and D system. They would have had a nice covenant working system there, and then you would have had to have been going not just you know into a dungeon, but in a hostile land, 
and that you want to get in the dungeon because you are not able to fly and everything else on the island wants to hurt you and can fly, so you're at a disadvantage. Get in those caves. Yeah, well, I just... I I love how, it, like, you can... You can do that with um, with with these ideas, and it, it's so it's so weird that it comes from something simple like uh, mm. gargoyles come from like a, a statue that comes to life, yeah. and harpies are are they from Greek mythology? I think? Yeah, I think they were just always harpies. I'm not sure if there was some sort of curse going on, but or or, or, or is it one of the things like the Medusa where there's supposed to be only one, and then. No, I think it was several harpies, I remember. Because okay. they're supposed to be like those, uh, one of the ones that abducts men and then uses them. That was a reoccurring theme they had <laughs> in the Greek. Yeah. They want our manly bodies. Yeah. Uh, don't subscribe to that. Sounds a little weird to me, but hey, if that's the predecessor to the furry, I'm fine with it. Whatever. <laughs> furry, that, well, that's another topic. Okay. Yeah. Another topic uh, for another day. I guess so. Uh, but, but yeah, that's like, they're very like they serve a specific purpose in the original, and then we kind of repurpose them. Mm-hmm. And and I guess that's okay because like you can bring you can bring ideas in from all different directions, like including biology, and say like you know what if there's a there are species rather than just a magical mm-hmm. creature or an abomination or something like that. Which is actually something what what they're doing with the redesign for the Minotaur in the uh, the D and D next. Okay. Is originally it was the Minotaur. Yeah. Capitalize exactly. it. There's only one of them. And then in D and D, all of a sudden they were a race. They kind of come from doing acts that should not be spoken in public to human women. And the hey, Minotaurs come out. And then you had them from the Krennish Minotaurs from the D uh, from the Dragonlance system. And hey, they're warrior sailors, but they're their own race. And now what they're thinking of for D and D next is that they're working on that. Uh, they are the results of cultist worship. When you uh, follow the beast within, which can be anyone, but they they have it as the Baphomet because uh, he's oh, yeah. had a strong historical connection in the D and D setting. And you, uh, you know, you pray and you make enough sacrifices for power, he'll turn you into a minotaur. And that's what they're supposed to be. They're no longer a race. They're an outcome. And if you encounter up to like eight of them, well, that was what happened to the entire cultists. They got changed. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, that's that's another story. Hmm. I guess. You, I mean, you can when you're creating these story, you can pick and choose your favorite. Like, do you want kind of a biolo- biological origin, or do you want a um, supernatural origin? Yeah, they flip flopped up between the editions. They said, uh, well, classical curse. Then they went to its a biological kind of curse, and then they seem to have gone back to the yeah, yeah, it's just a curse, and they just kind of you know you wake up one day after sacrificing too many innocent people, and hey, Minotaur. I don't know if they're going to make it a template or anything, but uh, well, yeah, it sounds like it's up in the air, and and you know it might as well. I mean, I'm sure their uh, savage species, I think, had a Minotaur. <laughs> it had a, a it had everything. Yeah. Trust me, there's there's one day I want to play a humanoid elephant. <laughs> it just seems like you can have so much fun with like maybe um, more of an Asiatic setting, go something like India. Yeah. Yeah, you could have a lot of fun going like uh, with that with the theme, and then all of a sudden, hey, there's your stats for the uh, the elephant person race. Go for it. Oh, that's weird. It sounds like a cartoon. Like <laughs> it does sound a little bit like a cartoon, but I think if you put enough culture, dress up around them, get, you know, write it up for well, them, it could wind up becoming uh, more respectful. Yeah, seem that's more a good point. true. Yeah, I think you're right about that because there are things that that seem cartoony in one context, but yeah, if like the spell jam or almost anything. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, there. I guess vorpal space hamsters, well or bad, <laughs> badly, and yet sometimes it comes out great. Like I mean, they, they, they their version of the neo guy was just revolutionary, great, wonderful. Um, tiny little spelljammer. yeah, tiny little spider guys that control umber hulks. Finally, umber hulks are no longer just this random beast. They have like a an added purpose. Yeah. They're like the slave race of these small guys, and they go around doing stuff. Nothing good, but they go around doing stuff. And so there's a reason why you're fighting this combination of monsters and what's going on. And what otherwise would have been silly, uh, like a warped spider person who takes slaves. Sounds kind of silly. And it sounds even sillier when you realize the slaves they're taking are hippopotamus people. (laughs) But you put it in the right light, it all comes out sounding a little deeper, a little more serious. 
Well, I, I, I hope so. I mean, if it, if it's only like spider people, hippopotamus people, it's what is that called? The animal head uh, <laughs> trope, I guess it is. It's Probably basically animal headed people, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or I suppose, I guess in the case for the Neogai, it would be more of an insect body. Because they had kind kind of a humanoid head on there. Yeah, yeah. But and, uh, well, and how do you, like, uh, I guess it's a related question. Like, how do you create, can you create an alien race, or maybe it's a fey race, or maybe it's mm-hmm. a race from, from the planet, like, you know, Nibiru, or something that's that they could reasonably reach Earth from, or something like that. Like, how do you create a race that's believable and not, like, um, a stereotype? Like, not mm. just, just grabbing, like, you know, these are hyena people. These are green-skinned people, but they're going to act a whole lot like Mongol hordes, sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, uh, I, I mean, I guess a lot of people <laughs> try that, and some people just... we. I think, well, we were talking about this before, the, before we started recording. Mm-hmm. Um... What did we talk about? Many things. The stereotypes from Star Wars, how a certain race... Oh, yes, yes. Sometimes how uh, the entire race, all we know of them is from that one person you see for maybe ten minutes in the movies. For all you know, they're a great race, and this guy's just the scum of his kind, but then you suspect his entire race is that way. But uh, actually, I think a lot of it comes from from just trying out new things and experimenting. Like... uh, let's take a, a religious thing for them. We'll create um, bunny people. Okay? Sure, they're bunny-headed people. They got fur all over them. Doesn't sound too great, does it? Add some culture to them. Um, we'll take some random domains from a god. The god of death um, has the domain of air. Their god of war has the domain of animals. And we'll extract from this is... Uh, Because the god of death uh, has air in his portfolio, air would be associated with death. Instead of burying your dead or doing something like cremating them, you could make an argument saying that, uh, no, the bunny people actually put the corpses of their people up on these tall towers so that the sacred birds can come and pick it clean, and then they just do something later on with the bones. Yeah, um, okay, I've heard this from the... uh the cultures in Nepal and Tibet. Yes, exactly. And all of a sudden it takes a new thing on that. You can start boring from that and then next thing you know, you're building up more of it. Um, the god of war, I said, with animals. You could put that in so that uh, wars aren't fought with many people and many sides. It's one person with a lot of trained animals. Yeah. Okay. And that starts adding things to them and all of a sudden they're not so much bunny people as they are the masters and lords of animals on the battlefield who have these tall carrion towers. And it's not then uh, just about the bunny. You've changed the perspective as you made a whole image of them, and there's more to it than that. Well, I, I, I like, yeah, I like what you did there. And I'm, I'm worried, too. I mean, you see this in World of Warcraft, because mm-hmm. you, they, they find one kind of cultural element like you were saying about the um, the towers where they leave their dead. Mm-hmm. You say, oh, okay, well, that's the kind of a mountain culture, uh, Nepal and Tibet and, and northern India. And then when you look for more ideas to add, the what a lot of designers will do is they'll say, oh, well, let's go back to that culture. Let's go back to Tibet and see what we can pull. And but Just take it whole cloth, so At that speak. point, yeah, it, it becomes a kind of, like, it's too much. It's too mm. much from one domain, from one area. Although, I mean, in some ways, they, they kind of, like, it logically follows. Like, if they live in the mountains, maybe, like, and, and they have this certain burial practice, some other things logically follow from that. And maybe, maybe some of the similarities with Nepalese people or... or Tibetans, I, yeah. um, maybe that some of the similarities might come become more focused in the reader's mind, even though they weren't intended. Mm. And then yeah, they so become like, that. oh, now this is the Tibet culture, which, uh, and I, I, I should mention. Um, well, I, I should let you. <laughs> well, that, that actually can uh, fuel back into your questions whether or not a biologist knows the forest better. If you were, say, you know, uh, someone who studies cultures, you would have more of an opportunity to know the subtle nuances. So instead of just portraying it as, okay, here's the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, the 
culture from the Himalayas, but they're bunny people, then you can start adding in the little things that that really show what the culture is about. Instead of saying, yeah, they're Nepalese bunny men in this case, you could say uh, how they wear their clothes sort of thing. And then just not just out say it, you just say they wear, you know, the colors like this, and then you see them painting stuff with sand doing this, and you give a little hint of that, and then the player fills it in themselves. Sometimes the less you say, when you say the right stuff precisely, works out for the best. Okay, yeah, that's another, that's another thought, idea. Yeah. And if someone else is going to run with the idea, it's best to leave something in the open so that they can grab something and go with it. If it winds up becoming Nepalese bunny men, well, that's just how it goes, sadly. I guess so. Um, yeah, I was going to point out that in Pathfinder, I don't know if you've read some of the Pathfinder material, but they, they just, they went ahead and they said, we're doing every country, like, every kind of significant country has an analog in Golarian. So they have, mm. they have an Egypt, they have a Persia, they have a, like, they have an India, they have a, Tibet. Oh, I don't know if they have a Tibet. <laughs> it's somewhere in there. They have a Japan and a China. Mm. Or I'm, I'm not sure if they actually... They may have combined both Japan and China. Mm. I'm not sure. Into Tian Sha. I, well, I, that, I think that's a continent. Well, I'm sure Like if people are listening, they're probably like... They probably you know don't know anything. Going, How dare you speak of my precious <laughs> setting. <laughs> well, um, that is the advantage of actually taking something whole cloth. Why does everybody keep coming up with an Egyptian or faux Egyptian setting? Because you know just enough about the Egyptian setting where you can describe they build giant pyramid structures and all of a sudden everybody sort of gets it. So you don't need to do all that reading. You can cut short the amount of stuff and make it a thinner product and just have everybody go with what they know. Yeah, uh, well, I, I guess, I mean, I'm, and I guess if that's like, if you're selling popcorn or candy or, or whatever, and, you know, you want light material, kind of, mm. you want something that people can have fun on a Saturday night or Friday night. People like popcorn, but would they like popcorn if you didn't tell them it was spiced with habanero peppers? That mm. might, uh, probably taste pretty good if you're it's expecting like it. If you're not expecting it, it's probably an affront to your mouth. So it, I guess it's kind of how you approach the situation with what you have. Sure. Call them fire flakes. Fire flakes. Yes. I stole that. Oh, okay. So. Yeah, that's not yours. No. But, but what was yours? Oh, the net thing. Yeah. Yes. Yours. Yes, the net thing was totally <laughs> mine, um, <laughs> even though it's completely qualitative and not quantitative in any real form. But... Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, that's there's a lot to be said for taking something whole cloth and a lot to be said out of making uh, patchwork. Um, mm -hmm. We'll go back to WoW. Yeah. Um, the uh, the tour in there, they could have just gone with, oh, these are Minotaur people. No, they went with, you know what, we're going to take some First Nation stuff, but we're not going to take a First Nations thing. We're going to take a little bit from you guys, a little bit from you guys, some of you guys, and we're going to come up with a nice blend. It's going to be an homage to the Plains people with a little bit uh, from the coast people because everyone likes the totem poles. They, they look really totem poles. <laughs> they look nice. Honestly, yeah, well, if you had the chance to have a totem pole somewhere in your apartment, would you go for it? I, I do. I, I, I thought I used to think that the, the Torin like iconography, those mm -hmm. like weird faces on their buildings. I've always thought that that it's silly, but at the same time, it works. Well, see, here's the thing. It's a little silly, but when you look at people using other races, like especially the animal type races, it's really not that bad. I got uh, the the one uh, Forgotten Realms book on the uh, the scaly folk, the UNT and all that. They are nuts on snake designs. You want to go somewhere, the fence is a, it's a giant, like, two-headed snake, and you enter the one path between the two open mouths of the snake, and everything on the inside has got a scale pattern, or it's mm -hmm. set up and designed for snakes. You don't see that with people. You don't see everyone going, dude, everything we're going to make is going to be human head, or skulls, it's just going to be human, human, human. All our designs. Bracelets is going to look like people holding hands. You don't see that. It gets really repetitive, and the more you hear it, once you notice it, the sillier it gets. So merely just having mm -hmm. like a, a face kind of like you on the occasional building, man, I ain't even mad. Just let that slide. I guess so. It, well, the tour, and, I mean, it, I guess I I can't complain a lot because I know that it's 
that's how you do it. That's mm-hmm. how you kind of create. But it also, it feels kind of, like, awkward and weird when, like, I know a, a, a very little bit about Native American, like, like which tribes exist mm-hmm. in their history and stuff. And when I see, wow, like, calling the village is... What is it, Tarajo Village or? Well, not anymore. But yes, they they, they burned it. Oh, but, it's, yeah. Um, Tarajo it, ruins. It's it's not the thing that I like best about Well. I, I don't mm. know how to. I I don't dislike it, but it's not like it doesn't excite me. Mm. On the other hand, uh, uh, let's let's go back to the face sort of thing. It's not on all their buildings. The one where you really notice it is in. Uh, their main city. It's in that giant uh, structure where everybody lands when they've been flying in. Yeah. Now, you could just take that as them putting up a giant totem pole. What if it's a little bit more subtler than that? What if they were actually going for, this is the Torin equivalent to the Statue of Liberty? Then, of course, it would have to have a face. Yeah. Well, it, I don't know. Is that monument named? or? It's mm-hmm. just the flight center. The flight center. That's well, all yeah. everyone's ever referred to it as. How do I fly out of this... I keep falling off the bluff. <laughs> and then you get directions which are wrong, and then you chew the person out, and then somebody actually gives you the right directions, and then you figure your way out. Uh, yes, it's been a while since <laughs> I've played WoW. There's a reason why everybody sticks to Ogrimmar and doesn't spend any time in Undercity. That's just bad layout design. Huh. Undercity, you got to run everywhere. Yeah, You're in Ogrimmar, it's all in one place. Although Thunder Bluff is actually pretty good for that, too. It, but nobody spends time there. I, I don't know why. Yeah. Well, I I played for a while when all the high-level characters were in Dalaran. Mm. In I the, did like the design of that city. I didn't have a computer well enough to run it. I had to stay out of that city or have less than one frame a second. Yeah, I remember that being really laggy. But then, then they had a, an expansion and they had a... Um, what is it, a sundering or a cataclysm? Yes, the cataclysm. And, and then, then it was nice to go there because I could actually move around and see things. <laughs> yeah, but nobody was there anymore. Everybody went back to Orgrimmar. But we'll mm-hmm. see. We'll see where people go with the new expansion. Uh, it's probably still going to s- just stick with Orgrimmar, I think. Well, now that you've got the playing for group stuff, you know, and you can just search and you never actually... Oh, yeah. After, yeah, after level 15, you never actually need to leave the city. You can spend the rest of your life sitting there. Oh. And that's about it. That doesn't sound that fun. <laughs> no, that's why very few people do it. But you could if you were really determined and that focused and lazy. Yeah, you could just... Well... But, uh, yeah, well, actually, if you look at uh, the new layout for Ogrimmar, they've done more to incorporate different things and structures, like uh, the areas they divide up between the valleys. It's not an orc head they've got. They've got a wolf. They do heavily associate themselves with wolves, but it's not an yeah. overwhelming factor. That's that's one thing you, you've really got to make certain you don't do. If you take from just this one thing, they're snake people, and you make everything they design and look like snakes, it's kind of ridiculous. And yeah, that's why you have to take more, and that's why people feel, I think, in some level, compelled to take whole cloth from one or a closely set of uh, groups, uh, historical societies. Also, it yeah. beats having to come up with your own wholly new one that no one's going to fully get except for you. Yeah. Because there's that fear. Well, I kind of I kind of wish that that was how we did sci-fi and fantasy, but I guess it's just not the well, case. Well, that's the way Tolkien did it, and everyone recognizes his brilliance. He came up with languages for them that people yeah. are learning yeah. and speaking. He came up with ways to, to make things work and, and really, really flesh out what a dwarf is, what an elf is, and even, you know, how hobbits are, are and how they came to be. If, unfortunately, that takes a lot of work. I mean, he didn't write this thing over the course of a summer. He spent a long time really digging it out. He, 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 like, he carved this thing. Like, somebody carves a masterpiece out of wood. <laughs> well, it, it, yeah. yeah. It good. And so that's the thing. I mean, it's really, is it going to be worth the time? If you're writing your own set of books, by all means, I say go into it, flesh it out, you know, find those little nooks and crannies, explore how it all fits together. If you're playing just your own homebrew campaign, you don't know how long it's going to go, well, as you saw, I mean, just with my, you know, migratory gargoyles, it didn't actually wind up being worthwhile. Yeah, that's true, and and I guess, um, 
well, I guess not worthwhile in the most objective sense. I clearly had a lot of fun I mean, designing it, so that was worthwhile for me. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and like, yeah, because a home, like your home campaign, you you kind of do have to laugh a little bit and have like stereotypes and jokes. Um, Unless you've got a really nice set of people that that really want to read your stuff, but you'd have to be either really entertaining as, as a storyteller to have them want to read like a small novel of back story for everything yeah. or bribe them with pizza. Well, and I, I guess the other way to do it would be to... And I, I, I know DMs... I don't know... Yeah, they tried it. Well, you you made this point, or did I make it, um, mm-hmm. about uh, incorporating the player's ideas because... When you play a game of D and D, you're basically you're telling a story about the people who are you know with you at the table. It's like, oh, you are the the hero of the story, and you did this, and you did that, and and you have an interest in it. So it, I mean, D and D is different from novel writing in that sense because um, if you can involve them, then you can create something a lot more exciting. Although I guess. Involving other people risks them bringing in those kind of stereotypical or half-baked ideas. And next thing you know, you've got three out of four of your party being nothing but Drizzt clones. Yeah, mm. well, I, I mean, I guess that's what you have but to hey, do. No risk, no reward. That's yeah, the yeah, best way yeah. to describe it. But, uh, but yeah, well, I mean, that's how they always describe what is D&D, and they effectively come out with the line, it's interactive storytelling. Yeah, but a lot of the times it's more like A versus B, players versus DM sort of thing. Yeah, or just mm. the encounters mm. are just players versus monsters. It's just mm. you know, it's just like a a war game, which is mm. where it started. So in the end, mm. if you're not willing to cooperate and design something truly grand, you wind up regressing the entire thing back to the mid '70s. Yeah. Ooh. Well, and I the, the thing I guess. In order to enjoy D and D, is you have to to maintain that uh, love for just that tactical aspect of the game, because otherwise, like, why are you playing D? Why not play a, a less uh, go with something like uh, yeah, the White Wolf stuff that doesn't have a grid square going yeah. on, and it's much more nebulous for that. Yeah. Although I, I suppose uh, for that case, it works out to more of a style sort of thing. White Wolf, with their uh, setting, tends to be more of a uh, macabre, you know, a uh, horror sort of style. If you don't want to play that, you kind of don't want to play White Wolf. Well, at least yeah. not their core set, their their World of Darkness setting. Well, yeah, it, I mean, cause, because you take on the... You know, you know, you're a vampire or a werewolf or whatever in that. Or a mummy. <laughs> or a wizard. Or a ghost. Oh, you can or a hunter who hunts a lot. Well, they I had a lot of fun <laughs> added stuff. I, 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 The mummy one didn't go over very well because you were effectively a mummified werewolf or something. It <laughs> got a little weird. Although their new world of darkness with the, like, you can be a Frankenstein monster. Yeah, a Frankenstein, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> they have a term for it, but let's face it. I could sit around and spend a lot of time describing to you that these are constructs and they're created and there's a whole terminology for it, or I could call them no. a Frankenstein. Yeah. Yeah. I ripped it off, and then you fully understand. That's true, that's true. Which feeds back into what we were saying earlier. Yeah. There we go. Uh, so I think that's about it for this first one, then, eh? Yeah, I guess, going? well, we've spent an hour chatting, and I don't know if anybody's ever going to hear this, but <laughs> maybe they will. Um, I so think it was pretty good, for, at least for a first time. We'll come back in two years when our muscles for this sort of thing have really progressed, and we're going to go, God, what were we thinking? <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, These so noobs. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, so, um, let's see. Bye for now, Internet. Uh, this is Josh Trelevin signing off. Take care out there, and don't click any strange links. And send us money. Fair enough.